Now I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Harry Rick Moody. Dr. Moody has recently retired as Vice President and Director of Academic Affairs for AARP in Washington, D.C. He previously served as Executive Director of the Brookdale Center on Aging at Hunter College and Chairman of the Board of Elder Hostel, now called Road Scholar. He is the author of over 100 scholarly articles as well as a number of books. His most recent book, The Five Stages of the Soul, has been translated into seven languages worldwide. He is the editor of an online newsletter, Human Values in Aging. And I would be remiss if I did not tell you that his long and distinguished career began with a doctorate in medieval philosophy focused on a well-known Dominican figure, Meister Eckhart. Let us now welcome Dr. Rick Moody to the podium. Thanks very much, Tina. Um, I want to begin, make sure the technology works correctly. This, by the way, is a medieval image of Hildegard of Bingen, who was, uh, she was not a Dominican. She lived before St. Dominic, but certainly she was a, a great figure. Um, and this is a kind of a theme, for, for not just for me personally, but for all of us. It's a greeting card I send to people. You see the scholar in the boat, how difficult it is to arrange the affairs of a lifetime at the water's edge. And that's really my theme, difficulty, uh, because uh, life is not easy. And as we get older, uh, we are called upon to develop a mature spirituality. That, after all, is what this whole Martin de Porres Center is about, mature, spiritu mature spirituality. Um, so uh, that's really the theme of what I want to talk about. The other thing I want to say, and I was very glad that Tina mentioned that I have uh, retired this year, just a few months ago, from AARP. Uh, somebody said that when you retire, you go from uh, who's who to who's he. And uh, that's another way of saying uh, something which Emily Dickinson said also. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? That's really what I'm here to talk about. Uh, Ram Dass, a great contemporary spiritual teacher, uh, said to us 20 years ago at a conference, he said, aging is the school of nobodiness. We have to learn to school, to go to school to become nobody. Well, fortunately, there's some good texts that we can use. And uh, many of them are actually medieval. This is an image of the human life course. And you see all the stages of life are equal. They're in a circle. And at the center of the circle is the image of Christ. This is very different from our contemporary image of life, which, as we know, begins to the left and goes up to that peak and uh, then goes down to the right. This happens to be one for women. There's a comparable one for men. Uh, for better or for worse, we're all on the same trajectory. So I'm really not going to talk about the contemporary view of stages of adult development because my feeling is that they give us the wrong map. If I landed here in Columbus, Ohio yesterday and had a map of Boulder, Colorado, where I live, that wouldn't do me much good. Uh, so we need to have the right map. And unfortunately, most of our maps of life, where are we going, really uh, direct us to this peak phenomena, Leben und Arbeiten, as Freud called it, to love and to work. That's it. There's no recognition that there is something in us that can grow and can develop. I had the great good fortune to live uh, for seven years as a caregiver with my dear friend Larry Morris, who died in our midst at the age of 97. And you see my then young son looking up at the old man. That's the great circle of life, the great circle of life. In my end is my beginning, as T.S. Eliot puts it in his great poem, The Four Quartets. Um, we do have maps, uh, but they aren't contemporary maps. Even the great Eric Erickson or Carl Jung or people like that will not give us a full map of where we are and where we need to go. So once again, having that map of Boulder doesn't help me when I'm in Columbus, Ohio. I need a map distinctive for human development in the second half of life. That's what Dante gave us in uh, his uh, Divine Comedy, which actually turns out to have been written because of a disaster. He was uh, exiled from Florence. At age 35, he reached his full peak, his goal, everything he wanted in life, got all his wishes, and at 35, midway in this mortal life, as he begins the Divine Comedy, uh, he was busted. 
He was in exile, put under death sentence, never made it back to Florence. Actually, we're all exiled in a certain way, and that's why the medieval writers spoke of our life on Earth as uh, in via, that is, on the way. We're on the way someplace. The question is, where are we going? There are some answers. Some of the answers are found in the great Christian tradition. One of the greatest, St. Augustine's autobiography, The Confessions, uh, and his remarkable, profound statement, our heart is restless till it rests in thee. Our heart is restless till it rests in thee, O God. And that really is the theme uh, put into contemporary language of uh, the book that I wrote, The Five Stages of the Soul. So with no further ado, let's plunge into those stages, although the truth is we're already in those stages. We're already moving along one way or another. For people who um, uh, are memory challenged, as I sometimes am, uh, I encapsulize them all on this slide. I don't have very many slides with words, by the way. That's the good news for everybody here in this room. Uh, somebody said, uh, I think it was an article in Forbes magazine that said, friends don't let friends use PowerPoint. Well, my PowerPoints are all visual images, as you can see, and these are the only words that I'm, I'm going to show you because they're the words of the five stages of the soul. So hopefully uh, we will move through them, and get, I'll give you a sense of what I mean by that, and uh, then in the breakout session that we're going to have for 15 or 20 minutes, you can plunge in and perhaps look at those questions that I shared with you earlier. Um, we cast these... Uh, stages of the soul here into modern mythological terms, and many of us in this room and watching this webcast, I'm sure, remember Star Wars, which begins with Luke Skywalker there uh, in exile, just as Dante was in exile. Uh, but even more, also like Dante, Luke is the prototype of the hero. Uh, Joseph Campbell would have called it the hero with a thousand faces, the hero who doesn't know who he is. And that's basically who we are according to the message from the great religious traditions, the wisdom traditions, as Houston Smith would call them, uh, we need a reminder of who we are. And sometimes elders function in that role. They may be chronologically older, or they may be spiritually older, but we do need guidance. And I'm going to come back to that point in a second, because it's fundamental to everything that I'm saying here today. So for Luke, uh, of course, uh, he has to be recalled to the, the question of his identity, who he is, where he belongs, and what is his goal in life. That moment of the call is something that we're familiar with, certainly in the Christian tradition, because St. Paul is the prototype of the guy who thought he knew where he was going. See, he had the map for Boulder, but he was located in Columbus. And so he had the wrong map. It was from the Jewish tradition. He'd, he'd learned it all. He was a very learned, learned fellow. Uh, but it was not until Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus that he really received, literally, the call to become the person he was meant to be. If you want a phrase for what I'm aiming at in all this, become the person you were meant to be. Uh, most of us uh, don't have experiences like Paul on the road to Damascus, but we may have, a, let's call it a Peggy Lee experience, because she had uh, a song called, uh, Is This All There Is?, and that is often the moment of the call for people, when they realize that they've fulfilled their goals in life, the children are gone, uh, maybe they, whatever their dream was in youth, uh, they've fulfilled it, or they never will fulfill it. And then they see the question in front of them, sometimes an abyss, sometimes depression, is this all there is? And for people who hear that call, who don't take the receiver and slam it down and say, no, I'll sleep a little while longer, for people who hear that call, uh, they cannot forget it. And this, of course, is Dante again. This is the beginning of the Divine Comedy, those famous words, midway in this mortal life, I found myself astray. And that's often the way that it is. We discover that we've been going in the wrong direction, because we had the wrong map, and now we need guidance. For Dante, it comes through Virgil, who leads him through the Inferno, then the Purgatory, and then finally, it's Beatrice who must lead him, the feminine principle, into paradise. Um, Sometimes dreams can be a vehicle for this. I was talking with someone earlier today about dreams, and I'm actually writing a book called Dreams and the Stages of the Soul. I do a lot of dream workshops. Uh, dreams, certainly in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, are ways in which God communicates to us, and uh, they represent a ladder. I'm going to come back to that image of the ladder, of the angel. Angel just means messenger. That's what the word angelus means in uh, Greek and so forth, a messenger. So we get messages in all kinds of ways. 
sometimes by dreams, sometimes fax, sometimes email, sometimes even the US postal system works. Uh, this is what Joseph Campbell would describe as the hero's journey, which has many similarities, not quite the same with what I'm saying, because what I'm saying is grounded in the wisdom traditions. Uh, and unfortunately, in our society today, certainly great institutions that I've worked for, been familiar with, like Yale, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the New York Times, I'm sure the White House. Um, if you were to talk about the stages of the soul, you might be regarded as a lunatic, a fool. That's uh, the tarot card image of the, of the fool. We've already seen Paul on the road to Damascus. What happens if you hear the call? If you really ask yourself the question, is this all there is? Well, you discover, in a certain respect, you're alone, but not quite alone, because if you go to Barnes & Noble or you go on the internet, you'll find that many people have had that experience. It leads them in some direction. But what direction? Here's an image of the direction, the labyrinth. And uh, this is located at the heart of Chartres Cathedral and many, many other cathedrals all throughout Europe. And labyrinths, really, this is uh, directly in Chartres, they're a very good image of our situation, that if we can find the right guidance, and that's, of course, a big question, if we can follow that path, we can follow the yellow brick road, so to speak, and get to the center of the labyrinth. Uh, that is if it's a monocursal labyrinth. There are also mazes which just lead you everywhere. That's a good image of the internet, by the way. You can spend your whole lifetime there and never find what you're looking for. Uh, the problem is that we're living in a time some people would call it the spiritual supermarket, in which every form of spirituality and psychology and you name it, psychosynthesis, Sufism, Zen Buddhism, it's all out there. Um, how do we find the path, the direction that's right for us? Uh, this is not simple. This is not easy. I do think labyrinths, and here's a whole uh, collection of labyrinths, do represent an image of what we need. Because once we enter the labyrinth, if it truly is a monocursal labyrinth, it, we follow that path. Some of you in this room or listening to this webcast may have walked the labyrinth. You will find your way to the center. And then, of course, you have to find your way back out. Fortunately, if you follow the path, it will also lead you out. And that's what I'll talk about when I come to the last stage of the soul, the return. But that's our, a, a really a very vivid picture of our life today. We're filled with mazes. We're filled with labyrinths. We're filled with lots of choices uh, to become the person who we are. But who are we? And who will give us guidance? Uh, unfortunately, we live in a world in which very often the blind are leading the blind. I wish I could say that every great psychotherapist is also a good person, a wise person, a person who is rightly guided. Not always so. Uh, we need to work very hard, and this is the second of the stages of the soul. The call, the search. The search is a search for what? A search for guidance, ultimately, for directionality. We have images of this in our religious tradition, the Star of Bethlehem. Uh, here's one. I haven't got time to read a dream that I had collected. Maybe I'll do that this evening, but this is a deserted church. The church is actually not deserted and broken. It's just that the guidance is somewhere in the lower basement or the attic or in uh, a stream or something else like that. Uh, again, I haven't got time, but St. Teresa of Lisieux, who uh, alas lived only to the age of 24, one of the great saints of the last century, uh, she received great assurance and guidance in her search through a very powerful dream, which helped her to become a Carmelite nun. Uh, where does the search lead us? For Americans who are interested in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we often imagine that if we hear the call and wake up and discover, really, I should be a different kind of person, and then we begin a search, that it will lead us to what? To happiness. Not so. Not so. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but the sword. And if the search is really successful, it will lead you to a deeper struggle. This is represented in the great imagery uh, of mythology throughout the world, because uh, at some point, Theseus has to slay the Minotaur. The Minotaur is the monster who guards uh, the labyrinth and who eats people. It's another name uh, for the ego, by the way. Um, this is one of the great gifts of aging, by the way, because now that I'm retired, my phone won't ring as often. Uh, pretty soon, nobody will know who I am, and maybe I'll have more time for contemplative prayer. In any case, uh, we are freed. And this is a problem for people like me, if I happen to be a public speaker or writer, all that sort of thing. But that's not what life is all about. Life is about something quite different. And unfortunately, some careers like mine uh, can lead you into a, an abyss, a labyrinth of uh, narcissism. You all know the, the story about the narcissist who says, well, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? 
Well, uh, it's very difficult to escape from narcissism, uh, particularly if you are talking to large groups of people, you're on a webcast, all of that sort of thing. But this is exactly what's needed in the struggle. This is the struggle. It is a struggle to avoid identifying myself with my words, or even worse, with your reaction to my words. And this is represented by the struggle to kill the dragon. Our deepest treasures, Rilke said, our deepest treasures are guarded by the fiercest dragons. And that fierce dragon is otherwise known as narcissism, as ego. It can be very, very depressing when you realize just how powerful the ego is, this, this uh, assertiveness in us that wants it my way. Wasn't that an ad in Burger King? I'll have it my way. Uh, we have to work hard to obey, uh, to learn to overcome that. Um, there is a part of us that doesn't want to know, that doesn't want to be the person who we ought to be, but just wants to go to sleep or maybe go back to sleep. This is an image here from Kandinsky, who was a great artist and wrote about the spiritual and art. Uh, the lady in Moscow image there, and you see that dark form. That's the shadow. And in a webcast this morning, we talked about the shadow. Lamont Cranston, the shadow knows. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Well, the shadow is not always evil, evil. But we spend a lifetime learning to, perspect, learning to perfect our persona, our role, the way that we present ourselves to other people. Obviously, if you're a professional speaker like me, you work very hard at perfecting your persona. But everybody has a persona. You don't have to be a professional speaker. You've developed it by the time you're an adult. And it's also a mask. And there's something deep in us uh, that wants to know and to be known. And that is the struggle to, to overcome that. The Desert Fathers understood this very well in the third century. By the time Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, uh, those Desert Fathers, beginning with St. Anthony, Evagrius, Ponticus, all the others, they knew that as soon as religion becomes official, Get the heck out of there. Hightail it to the desert. The desert may be inner, or it may be a real desert, but you need to avoid becoming crowned. Uh, I often wonder why, Saint, uh, why uh, the Pope Benedict uh, uh, decided to retire and what he's up to these days. We never had a pope who retired. And yet, uh, imagine the difficulties of being in an office like that, or any office, any position. Uh, this is a challenge. and so. The greatest saints have often been the ones who fled to the desert. If we uh, are successful, I don't even want to put it in those words because it sounds like it's my job to be successful, and in fact, it isn't really true. There are moments when we strive on this path of call, search, and struggle uh, to see what really needs to be seen, the truth about ourselves, the truth about the world in which we're living, and that moment is the breakthrough. Uh, it can last a split second, it can last longer, but actually it's not in time at all because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the great saints throughout history have been people who have been touched by that feather, by that uh, Holy Spirit. Here's Saint Therese, uh, Teresa, of, uh, a Spanish saint, uh, and uh, Bernini's wonderful sculptor, sculpture of her. Uh, some people experience it in near-death experiences. I have many dreams uh, that I've collected uh, of people who had, in effect, near-death experiences. And we see people who come back from these experiences and say, I now see my whole life laid out before me. But they come back because something more is required from them. And from us, by the way. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, that moment of breakthrough, that moment of uh, insight and depth contact, sometimes called mystical experiences, experiences of higher consciousness, many different names for this. But those breakthrough moments are to be treasured. Um, I noted that in this residence where I'm staying uh, tonight, there's a St. Thomas Aquinas room just down the hall from me. And so I couldn't help but think about St. Thomas because St. Thomas, one of the great uh, figures, uh, theological figures in the Catholic tradition, certainly, um, toward the end of his life, a few months before the end of his life, had a very profound experience. Something happened to him in chapel one day, and he came out of the chapel, and he, uh, his secretary, because he was an enormously productive uh, man, uh, said, well, what, what happened? What's, what's this all about? Uh, and uh, St. Thomas just shook his head and said, um, everything that I have written to this day seems like straw to me, just like nothing compared to what God has given me. And he never wrote another word for the rest of his life.
He never wrote another word for the rest of his life. That's not necessarily something to be recommended, certainly not to authors like me. You know, something in me horrified, never write another word. How could I live? Stop me before I write more. But uh, Thomas was expressing something very profound. Namely, he was expressing what cannot be expressed. And the profound truths of life that come to us in those moments of breakthrough are not always ones that we can even share with other people. We can't perhaps even quite remember them. I began by showing that image of Hildegard of Bingen, uh, who lived in the 12th century. She was a different type than St. Thomas because she had these experiences earlier in her life, but instead of stopping the experience of transcendence, the breakthrough experience, actually enabled her to write, to become a poet, to become a writer of music, to become a physician, a healer, uh, and a great leader uh, of the church. And of course, popes and others, once St. Bernard had validated uh, her experience, uh, they came to seek her out and seek guidance. So she represents yet another dimension of this. St. Thomas, of course, was a member of the Dominican order, very appropriate, as was Meister Eckhart, who I studied many years ago. Uh, Meister Eckhart, who had all those profound mystical experiences, People forget that he was also master of the Dominican order in Germany. Thousands of, of monks, thousands of, of friars, rather, uh, were, were under his guidance. We see his name on wills and uh, labor documents, contracts, things like that. Uh, so he could have been uh, you know, the head of his condominium or whatever it might be. He was involved in the world. That is to say, Eckhart, uh, like Hildegard of Bingen, represented another dimension of the mystical path, to be in the world, but not of it. To be in the world, but not of it. And of course, uh, Francis and Dominic both were examples, the whole founding of the Friar's Order, of something which was different from monasticism. It was not a fleeing from the world, as in uh, we saw in the Desert Fathers. It was actually embracing the world. And even a, a, a great figure in our own time, like Thomas Merton, although he lived in the monastery at Gethsemane and was vowed to silence, he was actively involved in the world around him and concerned about the world. So here's the paradox. Uh, we move through these stages of the soul, call, search, struggle, breakthrough, to this final culminating peak that Dante describes, the divine vision of paradise, and then we come back, we come back. So there is one more stage of the soul that I want to mention, the fifth stage, the last stage. Why is there a stage number five? Because it is a temptation for people, just as it is a temptation for people to want to search for happiness and not realize that that's not why we're on earth, obviously. Uh, we're on earth for something else. Uh, and what we gain is through that struggle, that, that transcendence, that breakthrough. And once having uh, been given that gift, we now have to bring that gift back and help others. So uh, this is the, uh, the last stage of the soul, which I'm uh, you know, showing here through this uh, example of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, because the Wizard of Oz is also a parable of a quest. And you remember that at the end of the, uh, the Wizard of Oz, she discovers that the wizard uh, behind uh, the curtain really is no wizard at all. And that's a moment of realization that many of the goals that we strive for in our life are really not worth striving for, perhaps. And sometimes when people retire, they realize that. Uh, I look back upon my own career now that I'm retired from AERP, and I say, that was all very interesting. I don't repudiate it. I'm very glad that I did it. There are many things I never would have learned in my life unless I'd spent years, for example, as a fundraiser, which is what I try to help people with now. But that's the point. I'm not sitting on the mountaintop. I'm, I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. I'm helping people, small nonprofits with fundraising. I'm doing whatever I can to make the world a little better. And at the end of uh, The Wizard of Oz, uh, you remember Dorothy realizes she just has to click her heels like that, and her feet come together, and boom, where is she? She's back in Kansas. She's back in Kansas, because she never left Kansas from a certain point of view. And in the same way, this whole idea of the spiritual journey will go somewhere else, will reach a mountaintop, all of this is an illusion. Everything we need is right here at this moment that I'm speaking to you. You don't need to go anywhere. What you need to do, what we all need to do, is to shift our frame of reference. You remember that, that wonderful movie, It's a Wonderful Life. He goes through this, again, a near-death experience, uh, really, when Clarence the angel uh, saves him and shows him what his life would have been like. And notice here, 
here, here he is, the hero, back uh, with all the people gathered around him. And there's Zuzu. See that little girl who he's holding? Zuzu is the only one of these people who's still alive today. All the others have died. And my friend Connie Goldman, a radio journalist for NPR, uh, who we do things together. Connie's now in her 80s. Connie spent a week living with Zuzu. Zuzu is now living, I think, in Missouri. She's about 70 or something like that, maybe a little older. Zuzu did not have a wonderful life. Zuzu was a child actress. Her parents stole all her money. She, she was penniless by the time she grew up because they stole all the money. She, she married. She had a child who committed suicide. She became an alcoholic. Her life was a disaster. And somehow or other, through the gift, through the divine gift, she pulled out of this. And so what she does now is tell others, it really is a wonderful life, but not the way you think. Not the way you think. Another example of the five stages of the soul happens to Scrooge in that wonderful Christmas carol. What happens to him? It's through a dream. He's called by Jacob Marley. He goes on a search, reviewing his entire life. And finally, at the very end, he sees his own tombstone, and he says, uh, he says, just as in It's a Wonderful Life, must this be? Is this my future? And he realizes it's not so. He, there's still time for him. There's hope. And so what happens the next day? Scrooge is back at his job, and Jacob, and his, he's there with Bob Cratchit, and Bob Cratchit thinks he's the same old guy, but no, he's different. And I suspect that if Dickens had wrote another novel, he would have, it would have been all about the Scrooge Foundation. Because Scrooge has taken his breakthrough experience and brought it back into ordinary life. Before, before enlightenment, we chop water and carry water. We chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water. So what is the end of the spiritual journey? It's not doing anything. These are some, some images that I love from the, the Zen tradition in Japan, the ox herding pictures which begin with the search for the ox. And this is a representation, not of the five stages of the soul, but maybe 10. There could be any number. We don't have to pick a number. Uh, but the ox represents the goal that we have in this life, to become the person we were meant to be. We know we're not living quite the life that was intended for us. We're not quite the person we, we hope to be. Uh, but there's still time. And the story of the ox herding pictures is the story of moving through that search, moving through that struggle to tame the ox, finally to raise, to, to ride the ox home, even to transcend the ox, the idea that nirvana and samsara are one, because both the ox and the self are transcended. But this isn't the end of the journey. Where is the end of the journey? Reaching the source, and finally, the return. Return to the marketplace with helping hands. Can I help you? Can I help you? Those who God wishes to bless, God puts in their hands the means of helping others. This is the real blessing, not to be on the mountaintop. St. Teresa of Avila died on an ox cart in rural Spain as she was traveling all around the country helping others. If you go into this facility, you will see the pictures of all the sisters who were helping people. Action and contemplation, Martha and Mary. One of my great heroes was Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, who some of us remember of a certain age as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. But after he died, they discovered a book, that, a journal that he'd been keeping all his life called Markings. And in that journal, they discovered that he was keeping a record of his dreams, keeping a record of his deep mystical experiences. And Hammarskjöld said this in Markings, in the point of rest at the center of our being, we encounter a world where all things are at rest in the same way. Then a tree becomes a mystery, a cloud a revelation, each person a cosmos whose riches we can only catch a glimpse of. The life of simplicity is simple, but it opens us to a book in which we never get beyond the first syllable. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. The five stages are not really a journey, but a spiral as we move round and round and constantly come back to where we started. We shall not cease exploring, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Meister Eckhart, my great hero, uh, he wrote all these books. 
He was a professor at the University of Paris, all the rest of that. He said, if the only prayer you say in your whole lifetime is thank you, that's enough. That's enough. Another one of my heroes is Rumi, who put it this way, inside the great mystery that is, we don't really own anything. What is this competition we feel then, before we go, one at a time, through the same gate? We shall not cease exploring, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So that's our journey. That's our task. That's what's been given to us. And now, according to my slides, we must have reached the end of our journey because we're back at the beginning. <laughs> this is Hildegard of Bingen once again. So maybe this is a point at which we can stop and turn things back to the dialogue uh, among our listeners at a distance and also in this room. And I will say again at the risk of repetition what I said in uh, the other uh, webcast that I did this morning. It's a quote from Martin Buber, who said, all real living is meeting. All real living is meeting. I don't think he was talking about the meetings that we had in the faculty or at AARP, but uh, he's talking about what you're going to do right now. So thank you, Tina, for uh, having me for this last session. Now I know it is the last session. And uh, let the rumpus begin. <laughs> <laughs>